Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity at the end of a year 2020. As we transition into a new thing, we remember that you are a God who always change the past moving forward to doing a new thing. And so we pray that as we have been challenged this year with so many testing and still we are being tested in various ways, especially because of the pandemic that we have, that has so affected our lives and we are still trying to find our way and we have lost so many loved ones all over the world the empty spaces in people's hearts this evening as they think of the darkness that has been part of this year but there has been also the blossoming of new things new light shining as the resilience of so many people have come forward to support one another in love and kindness, genuine from the heart. And so we thank you on this day, dear God, as we begin this new year, thanking you for all that you've done and continues to do to sustain us. We thank you for your presence with us tonight and may the light of your love and your peace shine in our hearts and renew our spirits as we look forward to a future. May we be more committed to you who is building this house as we work in the house to further your will and purpose. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So brothers and sisters, once again, we have traveled together this year, 2020, and it's been a path that none of us have traveled in this particular manner because it's all new. Our lives have been touched in so many ways. We could not have imagined walking around distancing ourselves that we are not able to worship in person or families are not able to get, get, get together without risking the lives of the loved ones. Things we took for granted, we can take for granted no more. Although there is relief, dear God, we thank you for that, but we do not know truly what the future holds, but what we should know is that we should face it with God. There's been a lot of darkness, but I've been pleased with the rise in the focus on justice. Suddenly, there has been a resurgence of the need to address so many ills that so many of us have been complacent in terms of feeling helpless, perhaps, because of the way that the darkness, the violence, the racism, the gun violence, the poor and homeless growing in numbers, the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer, nothing that reflects the kind of house that God wants to build in this world. And the house he wants to build is built with people not representing the kinds of behavior and hurt that we cause each other but the kind of resilience and love that has been so much a part 
of how people have risen from the ashes in order to, 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 to help each of us grow into a better hope for tomorrow. And so as I thought about this year and the names that tonight's gospel speaks a lot about names. The readings helped us to move along from sharing to how God is building something by revealing himself and as the unfolding of his presence in the, in the, in the world, as he continues to unveil himself, the light of who he is shines brighter and brighter. From the beginning when he created Adam and Eve, he gave him, or though those, the human beings that he created, the authority to rule over the earth. And he gave Adam the authority to name all the animals. And so naming things is important. It's very important how we name that is given to things. If you think about the things that are in the world, this virus had to have a name and there's a reason why they call it COVID-19. Because it, it started, I think in 2019. And I think the COVID has to do with the kind of virus that it is. But a name is usually selected in order to say something about the thing that it represents. And so people give names to their children for, with, for various reasons. You may give the name of a child because of a relative that you love and so, because you love that person, the baby that is born, you name that baby after that person. And that's the reason for the naming of that child. Or there is a father who has a son and the, the son has the same name as the father and that becomes a junior. So you have a father who has the name as a senior and a junior, that is intentional because the father is so happy to have a son that the father names the son after himself. Or oh, someone you may name a person, a son or a daughter from a famous someone whom you have felt has been a contributor in society that you respect so much that you name your child after that person. You may be a lover of music and you name your child after someone who was a famous musician. Louis is a famous name for that famous musician. Louis Armstrong, even in my family, we have the name of, I have a brother whose name is Louis and his name, his last name is Armstrong. No relative to Louis Armstrong. There's some names that children have and they don't like the name and they feel they're stuck with the name that their parents gave them and they don't want it. And so they, some people change their names because they don't like the name that they were given. There are some names that you hear have you been told or someone tells you a name and you thought that name is so frivolous? Well, how could anyone name their child that name? 
Just think about the various names that you have encountered and your response to that. So in any case, the name of a person based through their life is something he or she is going to have to live with unless, the, uh, you, unless you try to change it. And people generally judge you prematurely by your name. Sometimes when someone gives, says a name and you have not met that person, you, you sort of have some feeling about what type of person that is. And although there is no reason for coming to those conclusions, which is fair, that is something that's very common by we, we make assumptions about a person by their name. Just think about that. So that is why naming a child is very important. Don't be hasty, think about why you want to name a child that name and, and what significance does that name have as you want to bring this child into the world. Now Luke tells us that on the eighth day after the birth of Jesus, the eighth day, and tonight is the eighth day, Mary and Joseph took their newborn son to be circumcised. And that was what was required by the Jewish religion for the males. That was something that God had told Abraham centuries earlier that every person in his home household was to be circumcised as a way of identifying that person as a, an Israelite. And so during the liturgy of circumcision, the, the boy is named. Similar to what happens when we have baptism, the question is posed to the parents and the godparents, name this child. Similarly, in the Jewish tradition, the rabbi who performs the ritual of circumcision would ask for the name of the child. And the Mary and Joseph responded, Jesus. And there it was, Jesus was named. The name was given to the parents, not by the parents coming up, but with that name as we generally do as humans. But this was a name given to Mary and Joseph by God himself. So it's a beautiful name. It's a great name. It's a powerful name. The name of Jesus. Throughout the Near East, ancient Near East, the thought was that a name carries the description of a person or a thing. People chose names for their children because it would describe some aspect or character of that child that they could identify that child. And a good name would say something about who the parents hope that child would become. And so Jesus, the Latin for Jesus is Joshua. If you remember, Joshua was the one in the Old Testament that led the children of Israel into the promised land. It was Moses. Moses got them to the desert, but they, were, they went around for 40 years. But Joshua is the one whom God gave the opportunity to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. Think of that name and Jesus bears that name. The Latin for Jesus is Joshua. So there is a connection. When God reveals things, there is a connection how he uses things to point to something else in terms of the role and the ministry that person offers. And something similar to a good name that Jesus is also means in Hebrew salvation. And what did the angel say? Name him Jesus because he will save us from our sins. He is savior. So Jesus also means savior. See, the name that God gave Jesus reflects 
actually the role, the mission that he has in the world. And he is the deliverer, the rescuer, Yahweh. The name for Jesus also, for Jesus is God, is one who delivers. And that's exactly what Jesus did. So God was very precise in the name that he gave Jesus because that name would represent the mission that Jesus had in the world. Also, he bore the name of God. And so the angel of the Lord had come to Mary and told her that she would have a son and that she should name him Jesus. So God ordained from the beginning that Jesus would be the one, the God of salvation, that he would be the God of deliverer and the God who would rescue us from sin. And so that was an important name. But Jesus was not just the firstborn child of Mary and Joseph. He was, as Christians know, the incarnation of God. He was God with us. He is God of all creation. And he is also as human as any of us. Think of that, you know. Jesus' name is just not a name. Jesus' name points to a actually the thing, the, 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 the role that he plays. His name embodies his mission. It's not just a frivolous name that sounds well. It has depth of meaning for his purpose in the world. And one of the tenets about Judaism is that the name of God cannot be said. In the Jewish history, the Jews never could say God's name. God's name was too holy in order to repeat it. And so when they had no, no way of, they had several ways of calling God. They called God Yahweh, but they did not pronounce the, the, the vowels. And so God whose name was too holy in order for them to express his name in words. Think of it, when God revealed himself, he was too holy for them to actually call his name because although God was with them, God revealed himself as a distant God through whom they could not really in person be present before God. If you recall when when Moses encountered God in the burning bush, the voice, it was a voice that, that, uh, that, that Moses heard, says that to take off his sandals for he's standing on holy ground. Cause that's where God was, but he couldn't see God. All he saw was a bush that is fire. And fire is also a symbol that represents the presence of God. And so, Mo Moses says to God, who am I going to say that you are? Because what do I call you? Because God is not a person that had a name that they could relate to. And so God said to, to, to him, tell them that I am that I am. I am. I just exist. I am. I am past. I am future. I am. And so from the time of creation, the people did not know how to, to name God until God revealed himself to them. And gradually they, 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 they named God early in the, the, the time of Abraham. They called God Elohim, meaning strong God. You know, in those days they had house gods. You know, remember in the darkness, we lose sight of who God is. The Greeks had their... There are Greek gods because they did not, they sort of lost sight of the real God who had existed. Darkness had come into the world and they no longer knew God the way Adam and Eve knew God. Generations did not know God. And so they had house gods. So as they think about this divine or this power that they could not explain, they use the same name for God as the name of God became began to be revealed. 
that, that evolved into Elohim. And later on, they called God Adonai, which was translated Lord. So we do ask, call Jesus Lord. God exalted him to be Lord. And so as the people engaged God and God revealed himself, the name changed to reflect more of who they understood God to be. And so in this Lord is the Lordship that is described as one of the character of God. He is Lord. That's one of the songs we sing. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead that he saw. So we attribute that to Jesus because we acknowledge the divine presence of Jesus. So the world in which Jesus was born only knew God, although God was present with them from a distance. Even while they were in the, the wilderness, only Moses was able to go in the presence of God in the tent. But he did not see God. But when he returned, when he came out of the tent, the people saw that he was white. His face was white as snow. And they were filled with fear, although God was was with them through the wilderness. In, in the night, he was a, a pillar of fire. And in the day, he would be in the tent and only Moses would be allowed to, to go in and visit him. And even in the temple, the area of the most holy place in the temple, that was a place where God was present, but God was still felt as a distant God. So, this is how the people of Israel experienced God. God was near, but all God, all, also God was far away. And so you must um, understand that when Jesus came into the world, what a challenge they would have had to kind of uh, uh, come to a conclusion about how to receive Jesus. You know, in the Old Testament, Elijah had tried to, to, to see God, to get a glimpse of God in the winds and earthquake and fire. But what did he experience? The still voice, the still voice, small voice of God. That's how he experienced God. And so when this little child, which came into the world and was born, and the shepherds and the wise men and, and, and the name of that, that they gave Jesus his savior, which points to uh, a, a, a name that is pointing to a divine and a powerful name. The people of Israel, it was hard for them to imagine God could be in the flesh. That's why he had so much trouble with the, with the, with, with the Jewish priests. God in the flesh, that's impossible. God was this distant God who had not revealed himself in the person. Here we are, a human being claiming to be God and divine. So they had problems. And Herod tried to kill the baby, if you recall. The baby was, was very small, maybe two, three years old. And at two years old at least, because the scripture tells us that he, he gave the order to, to kill all the two-year-olds in his, in, his, in his realm. So he must have thought Jesus was really a threat to try to, to kill him because he knew the story of the Messiah. And he would be king to, he was a king. So suddenly, with Jesus on, the, on, the, on sight, people could begin to speak about God. Because God spoke, Jesus spoke about the Father. And Jesus spoke in a way that they were experiencing the presence of God. And as the eyes of people were open to, to gradually see more of who he is, they began to, to see God's face in Jesus' face. And they could begin to experience the miracles, the power of God through Jesus. So there is a change that's happening from the old name of God to the new understanding of what God wants them to, to, to know he is. Now, the Old Testament stories, and we've been studying that a lot in, um, by, uh, in our morning devotions, 
we experience God revealing himself as a mighty God, but this God is full of wrath against the people because they keep disobeying him and they keep worshiping God. Here God is trying to reveal himself to them and to teach them about the way of his expectations for them. And he's rescued them from slavery and he's done so much for them. And they are not following what God wants them to do. God gets angry because they're worshiping idols. They're doing all the things and disobeying him. God gave them the laws so that he would obey them. And all God told them is to love him and to love them him with all their heart, soul, and mind. And he gave them some straightforward rules for them to live by. But the people could not accept and do what God had asked. You see? And so instead, they created these false gods, and we still have these false gods today in our lives. And every commandment that God gave them, they broke the commandment, and we do that today. How much are we paying attention to this God who is the creator, redeemer, sustainer of our lives? We're still guilty of that today as the Old Testament person. And so God tried everything to get their attention as he's trying everything to get our attention today. With all their mistakes, he put, he banished them into exile. They were in exile for 70 years. He had rescued them from slavery. He had, he had uh, been angry with them with brimstone and fire. He had nations who had successfully, uh, uh, successfully in the wars against them succeeded. And in many wars, of course, God was on Israel's side. So he tried so many ways in order for the people to get to know him and to obey him and to love him. And he's still trying to do that with us today. And God couldn't succeed in them with the, what he had done. They weren't it wasn't working the way God wanted it. So God tried a new thing in Jesus, you see? He tried a new thing. God is always trying a new thing. So he tried a new thing. St. Paul says in Galatians, but when the fullness of time came, God sent his only son, born to a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those who were under the law and that we might receive the adoption of children. And because we are children, God sent out the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So we are no longer servants, bond servants, but we are sons and daughters. See, God has brought us along. We have been disobedient and everything, but he brought, brought us from being bond servant to sons and daughters. He did a new thing in his relationship with his people. And so, we are no longer what we were, but we are his of God through Christ. We inherit what God has planned for us because of Jesus. So, God decided to, re to respond to human beings in a different way, a new way. And from day, that day onward, we occupied a different place in God's heart and in the created order. In the fullness of time, God sent baby named Jesus, Savior. God's salvation to take us from fearful subjects of an angry God to be children of the living God. Jesus came into the world to redeem us from slavery to sin and to show us the face of a loving God. That's why in the New Testament, you see the compassion of God. With Jesus comes the new thing that God is doing in his relationship with 
humanity. Jesus brought us so close to God in a way that had never been experienced before. He did more than the prophets had accomplished and the religious leaders. The angel said to Mary, do not be afraid. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever and ever and his kingdom will have no end. Centuries earlier, God had promised that David, King David, that his kingdom will last forever. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 16, this promise was fulfilled in the coming of Jesus, a direct descendant of David, whose kingdom will have no end. What is in the name? What is in a name? The name of Jesus. Jesus is a beautiful name. Jesus is a beautiful person. He's a beautiful God. He's God's son. It's a powerful name. It's the name that we need to have in our hearts every day, Savior. Brothers and sisters, names are important. Not only Jesus' name, but the name we give each other. It should represent a vision of what we want a child or someone to become with God's help so that that child will grow up to serve God as Jesus did. Let us be serious about the names that we choose for our children. Let us be serious about the name of Jesus who embodies everything we need as a savior. He embodies the obedience as a son. He embodies the love of God. He embodies the power of God. He embodies the grace of God. He embodies the justice of God. He embodies someone who wanted to adopt us into his family as he builds this house of brothers and sisters. He is a name obedient to death on the cross so that he could burn away the sins that separate us from God, the Father, so that through the burning away of that fire, that John the Baptist says that he who comes will clean as a refinest fire. He will refine and, and burn away the, 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 the darkness that is in all of us so that we will be ready and prepared to be in that heaven, Jerusalem, that has been already prepared for us, where we will live together in peace and love, where the animals will live together in peace and love where there will be peace and joy and no more pain and no more sorrow, but life everlasting. Brothers and sisters, I give you Jesus, the name above all names, beautiful savior. He is a beautiful savior, God with us, blessed redeemer, living word, amen.